Hello, friends. Welcome to Chickenlandia and welcome to Bok Talk, your 100% friendly backyard chickens show. I am your host, Dahlia, also known as the president of Chickenlandia. I am a backyard chicken educator who has found peace and joy in the chicken yard, and it is my absolute mission to help you find that too. Oh my gosh, welcome back. I've been on hiatus for a couple, a few weeks. Uh, today is episode 10. I think it's episode 10 <laughs> of, see, I should probably check that before I get started. But anyway, of season five and it's a new year. It's a new day to love chickens. We just got out of a cold snap over here. I don't know what the weather is like where you are. I hope that you're out of the worst of it. Um, you know, maybe some of you got some new chickens for Christmas. Maybe you had one in a pear tree or you got three French hens or something, <laughs> or turtle chickens. Uh, <laughs> I hope you had, you got some good chicken gr gifts for Christmas. Um, but anyway, today we're going to talk about some very easy and prolific chicken breeds. These are good breeds, you know, if you're just getting started out. And of course, they're good choices if you are looking to expand your flock. And I'm going to answer some questions um, that were submitted through the website, welcome to chickenlandia.com. So what I'll do is I'll chat for a little bit. I will answer these submitted questions, and then I will open up the chat here live on YouTube for questions. Okay. If you want to submit a question to Bok Talk, all you have to do is go to welcome to chickenlandia.com. Go to the contact section, and while you're there, okay, you can click ask a chicken question, but while you're on my website, you're going to want to join the mailing list, Chickenlandia Nation. It is the greatest mailing list all across the multiverses, okay? Uh, you know, when you join, I, do, I am not a spammer. I do not send out a lot of emails, but I will send you a discount for my course. It is, it's an online course. It's called Chickenlandia's Backyard Chickens 101, a chicken course for everyone. And this is a fun, interactive course. It is a great way to get started with chickens or, and it's a good intermediate course as well. And you will get direct access to me, which I know a lot, you know, a lot of you have questions. You want to be able to talk to me directly and that's tough. I just can't do that for everybody. So I have to prior prioritize my core students. Um, and you can ask questions within the course. I usually get to them within about 24 to 48 hours. Um, so th that's it. That <laughs> I want you to go do that. I'm super proud of the course. Go join the mailing list. That's it. <laughs> okay, let me say hi to some people in the chat. Kay Davis is here. Hello, Holland York. Patty Morton, M. Barbarous. I hope I'm saying your last name right. Uh, Jill is here. Allison, a thingies. <laughs> Judy Zims. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, Coco, thank you for being here. Uh, Patty, I don't know if I already said Patty. And there's another Patty. <laughs> Okay, and that one girl is here, and we are waiting. Hopefully, the Chickenlandia presidential advisor will come in at some point. And there's Matthew. Hello. Okay, so let's chat about easy chicken breeds for new chicken keepers or for anyone looking for widely available breeds. You're going to see these everywhere that will generally be more, you know, quieter, more docile, and really good layers. Now, before we go on, I I really want to emphasize the word generally, okay? Because certain breeds will tend towards certain characteristics, but I want you to keep in mind that every chicken is an individual. They're going to have their own individual personality, and there's just no guarantee that a chicken is going to be quiet, for, you know, number one, that they're going to be quiet. <laughs> Most hens, when they lay the egg song, they, I mean, when they lay, okay, let me start that over. Most hens, when they lay an egg, will sing the egg song, okay? And if you don't know what the egg song is, 
it's the it's the sound that chickens make that's like buck 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 and, and they will do that like over and over the roosters will join in the whole flock will join in they're going to be singing the the song of their people okay and so no no matter what breed you get it is very likely that your neighbors are likely going to know you have chickens Okay. And I just want to say that because a lot of people are like, well, I want really quiet breeds because I'm not allowed to have chickens and I want to sneak my chickens here. That is, you know, it's good, just going to put you in a position where you're like freaking out every time your hens are making noise because they do make noise. And sometimes it's early in the morning, they lay their egg and they're singing that song. Um, there's just no, no guarantee that they're not going to be a little bit loud or chatty. Um, there's also no guarantee that a certain breed will be tame and want to be held, okay? Uh, or that a certain breed will not be, you know, bully other chickens. Like, this is just stuff that happens. It's part of flock dynamics. It's part of the individual nature of each chicken. Um, but we can talk about these certain breeds and they're more likely to have these characteristics, okay? I just don't want to mislead you and say, these chickens are quiet and they're never going to be bullies and they're going to be tame and they're going to want to be picked up. And, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Okay. I don't want to mislead you. So anyway, um, the breeds that I'm talking about today, they're going to be available, you know, at almost any farm store during chick season. Okay. And definitely on all the, on all the, um, um, hatcheries, you know, the webs, the websites for the hatcheries. They are, they're pretty, you know, fairly hardy chickens. Now these are production breeds, so they do sometimes have problems that production breeds have. It's just part of how we've bred them up until this point. Um, I did have a video that came out last week where I talk, I talk about, it's on my YouTube channel. I talk about adding chickens that you don't, you know, they're like, not like rare chickens, but you just don't see them all the time. And so I just wanted to like talk about some fun breeds that you can add to your chickens. But today we're talking about chickens that are very widely uh, available. Okay. And that are fantastic layers and great chickens to start out with. Okay. So here are, you know, is it a drum roll? Okay. The drum roll. <laughs> here are the chickens that I suggest. Number one is the black Australorp. Okay. Okay. The black Australorp is a standard sized chicken. I think there's probably a bantam, you know, a, a bantam one, but they're, they're bantams. They're not going to be as good. They're not going to have all these characteristics. They're not going to be as good layers. Um, so they're standard size, dual purpose chickens. They uh, average about seven to eight pounds. They are very cold hardy. All right. Uh, they are pretty good in the heat too, because they're from Australia. Okay. But you may have to take some precautions. Um, they have a single comb and they've got slate colored legs. Uh, they, like I said, they, they were developed in Australia from a chicken called the Black Orpington. So they're very similar in temperament to the Buff Orpington, which, was, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute. They've got beautiful black feathers. But I think the thing that is so striking with them is that their feathers have like this green sheen. And sometimes you can see like a purplish uh, sheen on their feathers. And it's just gorgeous. Um, they are absolutely excellent layers. Big brown eggs. Uh, sometimes one will go broody. They're not not super broody, not like a bantam or anything. But sometimes they'll go broody and they usually make good moms. Um, just friendly, calm, generally quiet. Should be pretty easy to tame, especially if you handle them from chicks. Okay, so that is the black Australorp. You're going to see those everywhere when you are looking for baby chicks. The next one is the Buff Orpington. They were developed in the UK, hence the name. Uh, <laughs> standard size chickens, about 7 to sometimes 10 pounds, uh, dual purpose, very good layers of a light brown egg. And they've got yellow legs. They've got the single comb. Very, very cold hardy chickens. Um, pretty heat hardy, but you need to watch them in the heat, you know, just so they don't get uh, overheated. And that's because like these, the both the Australorp and the Buff Orpington, they're heavier breeds. So in general, the heavier breeds, sometimes it's just a little bit harder to keep them cool in the winter. But they're pretty, you know, they're, they're pretty heat hardy too. 
Um, super fluffy. Uh, <laughs> fluffy butts. Uh, they might go broody. They they go a little bit more broody than the black Australorp. And they make excellent mothers, usually. They make excellent mothers. That's another thing that's like, in general, they make excellent mothers. But sometimes you might have a chicken that's just not that good at it, okay? <laughs> so just, you always have to keep an eye on them and make sure, especially if it's their first time with baby chicks. Um, and the Buff Orpington, I think, is best known for being very docile and very quiet. Um, but I did, I did have one in my flock, and she did sing the egg song, and the egg song was very loud, okay? <laughs> And they should be pretty easy to tame, too. Okay, the next one is the Bard Plymouth Rock. And this is like the quintessential chicken. You just see them a lot in movies. You see them on TV. You know, when you see like chickens in the background, you're always going to see a Bard Rock usually. A lot of people, when they think about chickens, they think about the Bard Rock or maybe they think about like... Uh, the leghorn. Okay. They are a very popular breed, dual purpose, standard size. There are, um, little ones. There are, are bantam ones. They're, they're relatively common. Like when you're looking for bantams, you could find the, the barred Plymouth rock bantams and they're super cute. Uh, and they're pretty decent layers. The, the little ones. Um, I, God, I feel like I had one at one point. I had a bantam Dominique at one point and she was super cute uh <laughs> they got they look like plymouth rocks um yellow legs uh single comb they are you know they're they're very easy to sex so that's a handy thing about bard rocks is that you can tell whether they're boys and girls by their coloring when they're born um super good layers of big brown eggs okay they are not especially known to go broody so if you're looking for that you may want to make another choice um i think out of all the chickens i'm talking about today they they are the second to loudest okay <laughs> um i had one and she honked like every once in a while you'll get a, a chicken that honks and she honked all the time she just walked around eh, eh. <laughs> very very cold hardy very, very cold hardy. And they do okay in the, heat, in the heat. Okay. My next recommendation is the Easter Egger. And I actually talked about the Easter Eggers in my other video that I put out last week. And it's just because they're, they're so fun and they're so versatile. Um, I do want you to know that they don't lay, like some people think, oh, they lay all different colored eggs. You know, like one day they'll lay a pink egg, the next day they'll lay a, a blue egg, the next day they'll lay a green egg. That's not how it works. They lay one color of egg their whole life. Um, you know, sometimes it might be green, sometimes it might be blue, sometimes it might be pink, and then sometimes it might be brown, okay? Um, they aren't a true breed. Easter eggers are not a true be breed. But that's okay. They're just fun, okay? <laughs> um, and they're usually standard size. There are there are bantam Easter eggers. They're pretty flighty, but they're fun too. And they lay, you know, different colored eggs. Um, they usually have slate legs, but since they're Easter eggers, they can have yellow legs. You know, they might have yellow legs. Uh, they have a pea comb, and uh, they usually have this super cute little beard that makes them look like an owl, you know, almost like an owl. So, very owlish, very cute, especially when they're babies. They just have like this little, they look like little baby owls. Um, and they're, they weigh a little bit less than the other birds I talked about today. They're about probably about five or six pounds, um, depending on the breeding stock that you get. Uh, so for that reason, not only are they pretty good in the cold, but they're going to be pretty good in the heat too, okay? Um, because their combs just aren't that susceptible to frostbite. They're pretty good in the cold and in the heat. Very good layers and usually very friendly. You know, the hatcheries know that people want these chickens. They're in high demand, so they're going to breed the ones that are nice and friendly and good layers. Um, sometimes they come with some problems that those kind of production breeds come with really all the breeds that I'm talking about today. They might have some usually reproductive problems, but in general, they're pretty hardy chickens. So, uh, 
I think those are the easiest. I know it's only four breeds, but to me, they're like the top four easiest chickens that you can get to start out with. They're beautiful, fun chickens. Okay. And very widely available. So I do want to now move on to my listener questions. Hold on. I got to get a drink (laughs) of tea. Okay. The first one, the first question is from Michelle. Hi. First, I want to say thank you for all you do. I love your work. Oh, thank you so much, Michelle. I have a question about dying chickens. I've had a small flock for about a year and a half now. I've had four chickens get a sl- get a little sluggish and then die a few days later. They were all of laying age. They died months apart. I'm wondering if you could help me figure out what is going on. I don't feel that it is a contagious disease or it would be more of them closer together. Okay. Um, so first of all, I'm so sorry that this is happening, Michelle. Um, I want to start out by saying that, of uh, you know, I'm not, of course, we all know I'm not a veterinarian. I can't diagnose your chicken, certainly not online. I could can't do that. <laughs> Um, and there are so many illnesses and issues that chickens can get that can look a lot like this. And it would be really hard for me to even guess what's going on with them. But what I can offer is just, you know, some things to look out for. And I'm not suggesting that you have, that you're doing any of this in your flock, but for the people listening and for educational purpose, I think it's educational purposes. I think it's really important if you're having a situation like this, to evaluate your practices and to decide if there's anything that needs to be improved upon, okay? First off, just make sure that your coop is is being kept relatively clean and that there's no ammonia buildup or mold buildup um, that your chickens could be getting into, okay? Because it's possible that they're getting into something that is is making them sick, Okay. So that's the first thing I want you to do. Like make sure everything is clean and you know, it doesn't, it, these are chickens. Like I don't expect it to be some kind of like pristine environment. <laughs> you know, right now my chicken coop is dirty. I mean, that's what happens, but it needs to be, you know, there needs to be a balance there. Okay. So relatively clean, no like mold or mildew or anything that might be toxic that they could be getting into around um, and certainly no ammonia buildup, okay? Um, Make sure, of course, that your chickens have a balanced diet and that they're getting, you know, you just want to make sure that they're getting enough nutrition and not too many treats. Uh, Make sure that they have enough room. And above all else, this is the most important thing, uh, make sure that they are not under any kind of like constant stress. Okay. Whether it be boredom, predation or threat of predation or something else, you just don't want your chickens to be constantly under stress because this will cause disease. And we, we know that, like we know that in people that stress will lead to disease eventually. Okay. Um, it's just one of those things. So make sure that you are being mindful about, about all that. It is possible that you are dealing with some kind of disease going on. Okay. There are diseases that chickens can get that they can carry that won't kill them unless they become vulnerable in some other way. Okay. Myco, mycoplasma can be this way. Mycoplasmosis can be this way. Um, Merix can be this way and uh, coccidiosis even can be this way. Like some chickens can just carry these, these things and they're not showing any symptoms. They might live until old age, but eventually it catches up with them when they start to become vulnerable. That is actually what takes them out. Okay. That doesn't mean that your whole flock is going to drop dead. Okay. What I would do if I were you is start really working on like some immune boosting things that you can give to your chickens and some support them as much as possible so that they can build resilience to whatever is going on. Because that is always your best bet for you to have 
healthy chickens that can fight things that are in their environment that they have to deal with just by being in a flock of chickens. So I do have some videos. I will link them in the show notes. Um, I think there's one where I'm just talking about the things that I did because I had a couple of years ago, I had some illness in my flock, um, in the fall, but I also like the first year I was here in, at this new property, I had a uh, coccidiosis go through my flock and it was a pretty harsh strain. And I had a few chickens that died and there's just some immune boosting things that I did. Of course, I talk about immune boosting things, uh, you know, in my course and in my book. So you can check those out if you want. Um, and I will leave a link to that video that explains some of the things I did when I had, uh, that severe case of coccidiosis going through my flock. Okay. Okay. Oh, I feel like I got something in my throat, so <laughs> I hope it doesn't come out while I'm talking. All right. Uh, one more question I want to answer. And, you know, these questions are not really, they don't really have to do with like the main topic that we're talking about today. But I do like to, I've just decided like, even if it, if I don't get questions about the main topic, I do want to answer some of the questions that come in through the website. So this next one is from Sandra and she says, I have one eight month old hen. The background is a predator broke into our coop and killed all but one of my chickens. We were shattered, as you can imagine. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we have completely fixed the vulnerability, mourned my baby's lost, and have gotten more babies. My question is regarding feed. My sweet girl eats scratch and peck layer feed, and the babies eat scratch and peck starter. When they go into the coop, they will be at the grower stage. Will it harm my sweet girl to get ahead a hold of grower feed or hurt the babies if they get into sweet girl's layer feed? I knew I know you are busy, 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 but I trust your advice and judgment. Thank you so much for your time, Sarah. Sandra. Okay, so um, first off, Sandra, I'm so sorry for the loss of your of your many chickens. That's that is so hard and such a hard thing to like come out to, you know, where you walk out into your coop and there's been something awful like that. I'm, I'm really, I'm really sorry. It, it happens to the best of us. Like it, it really, it really can happen to anybody. So I'm so glad that you're moving forward with chickens. As for feed, what you can do is since your babies are on grower, you can just switch everybody over to grower. Okay. Another thing, you know, usually a lot of times if people are using a different feed and they're, they've got their chickens on starter until they go on to layer, you can put everybody on starter, okay? It's better to put everybody on starter or, gr or grower. If the young ones are old enough to be on grower, it's better for everybody to be on grower than it is for the little ones to be on layer feed, okay? And the starter and the grower is not going to hurt the older chickens. They'll be fine with that. Okay. Just make sure that you put some, an oyster uh, supplement out. You can put oyster shell or you can put their eggshells crushed up or limestone. And usually the babies, like if they don't need oyster shell, they're not just going to be like chowing down on it. Okay. Like, um, if you watch in your flock, like the roosters aren't like chowing down on it. The babies aren't chowing down on it. It's just, something that they eat when they need it. Okay. Um, so I would do that until the, ba the babies are about 16 weeks old or until they start laying. Normally I would say switch them to layer either at the point of layer at, or at 20 weeks, but there's no harm in switching them a few weeks earlier because a lot of chickens will start out. They'll, they'll start laying at 16 weeks. Um, so it's fine to do that. Okay. I hope all that makes sense. And I, and I hope it helps to make things easier for you. And I, I'm so glad that, that you decided to keep going with chickens. Thank you so much, Michelle and Sandra for your questions. Okay. I'm about to open up the chat for questions, but before I move on, I need to make two announcements because it's a new year and guess what? In 2024, I still got to pay those chicken bills. <laughs> These chickens don't care that a year has passed, that we've gone around the sun one more time. They don't care. They told me 
that I have to work. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I need to let you know that as always, this podcast was brought to you by the folks at My Favorite Chicken. My Favorite Chicken is my favorite online shop to get my feed. I get my non-GMO, organic, and socially responsible scratch and peck feed from there. I get my chicken supplies, my fun chicken stuff, my fun chicken treats like chicken fun do. <laughs> That's actually a treat. <laughs> and there's another one. It's, it's I can't remember, it's like red, white, and bugs or something like that. There's some fun treats on there. This is all at My Favorite Chicken. I will leave a link for you in the show notes. This podcast was also brought to you by the folks at Small Pet Select. Small Pet Select is a small local company to me, but they have an online store that I know you are going to love. They have uh, three products that I'm using right now. I am using their pine shavings. I am using, they're great for deep litter. I've got them all mixed up with, with, uh, some, you know, chop straw and stuff, but it's great. Um, another one I'm using is their pet greens, which is sprouts that you can grow in a little pouch that are great for the winter time. And the last one I'm using is their flaked oyster shell, which my chickens really like for some reason. They just like the flaked kind. I don't know why. <laughs> They're a bunch of flakes. Uh, you can check these and their other chicken products out by clicking the link in the show notes. And there's a coupon for you too. And they also have fun stuff for chinchillas and rabbits and hamsters and stuff like that. Okay, now I am going to open up the chat for questions. Did the Chickenlandia presidential advisor show up? Are you here? I don't know if she's here. It's okay because my community is nice and we don't need moderation. <laughs> Hi, Susie Floozy. I haven't seen you in a little while. Okay, uh, post your questions in all caps, please, so that I can see them with these progressive lenses. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Hi, Chickenlandia presidential advisor. Um, okay. So Patty asks, how much is too much protein or should there be a limit to how much they can have? What I say, because I really, you know, I, I'm one of those people that I try to steer people away from thinking about things and like percentages and measuring things out because my focus is always to try and get people to use the chicken yard as a way to experience peace and joy and as a way to also experience something that our ancestors experienced, uh, you know, something that traditionally was just part of what we did. It was just part of our life. And we used, um, you know, a lot of our instincts when it came to feeding our chickens. So what I will tell you what I do in my flock, I've got a 16% protein feed that I give to my chickens, which is which is fine. Um, if it's the winter and they need a little bit extra, if they're molting and they little, need a little bit extra, then I will focus during those times on giving them some protein rich treats. Okay. But not in huge quantities. Like I, I will see people that are like, I mean, they will just, they've got their chickens on 22% protein feed. They're feeding them cans of cat food every day they're doing grubs or doing mealworms, like all this protein. And that can also have negative effects on, on the chickens. Like they can, there are conditions that they can get and certainly digestive issues that they can have from having that much protein. So what I would do is if you have them on like a higher protein feed, then you don't need to focus on giving them extra protein when you're, when you're giving them treats. Okay. If you've got them on a lower protein feed and they're going through a time when they need a little bit of extra protein, then you can focus on giving them some good, healthy, higher protein treats. And, and that's what I, that's what I would tell to everybody. And I have, you know, if you've taken my course or if you have my book, you know, I have something called the Chickenlandia chicken food pyramid. Okay. <laughs> and it's basically like a, it's a pyramid, just like the old, pyramid that, you know, we had our nutrition pyramid that was awful, but for humans, but this one is better. Okay. <laughs> and it's for chickens. So at the bottom there's their chicken feed. And then 
or, you know, whatever is appropriate for their stage of life. And then uh, in the next tier up, which is a little bit short, a little bit smaller, that's where you would have like healthy scraps, mostly vegetables and low sugar fruits. Okay. Like leafy greens and stuff like that. And then at the very top, you have treats and in the, in the very top. So that's the, the least amount of, of, um, you know, extras that you're going to give them. And in that one, I would have like high quality proteins, maybe some scrambled eggs. That's where you would have grubs. That's where you would have, um, like cracked corn, um, uh, mealworms and stuff, you know, shrimp tails, stuff like that. Okay. And so the, the point of that is just to have balance in your flock. So that's how I want you to think about it. You know, don't overthink it. Just think about how you, how you balance your own diet really and try and kind of transfer that to your chickens and just like, I'm just going to think about this reasonably and, and create some balance here. Okay. And go outside and give your chickens some treats and feel good about it. Okay. I hope that helped. Uh, Allison Day asks, uh, my pullets are 20 weeks and dropping into mating stance when I pet them. Do I introduce layer feed now, even though it's still below freezing or keep to higher protein feed for the winter? I, my, uh, recommendation is to switch them to layer feed now. Okay. So like I was just talking about earlier, um, you switch them to layer feed. I usually either at the point of lay or by the time they reach 20 weeks, you want them to be on layer feed. Okay. I, earlier I was saying it's okay to switch them at 16 weeks. And that's because they had like a, a lot of chickens. They had an older chicken and younger chickens in their flock. And so, you know, you can switch them all over. But in general, I would say at the point of lay or at 20 weeks. So I would definitely do that and start building those, those reserves of the nutrition that they need in their bodies in order to lay good, healthy eggs solid eggs with solid shells. Oh, Sasha. Hello. Sasha is 11 years old and watching from New Jersey. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Inga asks, what is your first chicken breed? All of them. <laughs> I had, I had got, I got like everything that they had. It was it was not responsible. <laughs> um, Bantam Rhode Island Reds, uh, Bard Rock, Buff Orpington, Black Australark, Speckled Sussex, Silky, Frizzle, <laughs> Bantam Cochin. Uh, and I can't remember what else. <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> okay. You're welcome, Patty. Oh gosh. Okay. That one girl asks, if you could grow only one kind of food for chickens, what would it be? I would, I would sprout grains for them. Okay. Uh, and you know, I would try to get, I'm kind of cheating a little bit. I try to get a, you know, a different, different seeds and grains and sprout, sprout them for them. Um, if I could only do one, gosh, I don't know barley maybe. <laughs> um and that's if they were in a you know like an enclosed run that was the only thing I could grow for them I would definitely sprout grains uh if the only thing that that I could grow for them and they were free range it would be pasture because they would have access to so many things out there like they would be able to get bugs they would be able to dig in the dirt and have all this exposure to that, uh, microbiome that's going to build resilience in them. Um, they will have different kinds of foliage. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, sprouts, if they're in an enclosed run and if they're, if they're on pasture, then pasture. Okay. Okay. So Debbie asks, I have one chicken who is a messy pooper. <laughs> I am always washing her butt feathers and vent off with soapy water. Is there something else I should use to wash her bottom off? LOL. I don't think so. I think, you know, just water would probably be okay, like warm water. 
Um, you know, you can use like a, a very mild kind of, um, soap. I, you know, I, I usually do recommend Dawn dish soap because it is, uh, uh, widely accessible. Some people will get on to me when I recommend that, but, um, it is something that I have used and I've never had a problem with. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you're doing fine. Whatever, whatever is working. I would, uh, make sure that you check for mites. Okay. Because sometimes when they're got, when they got that messy poop over and over again, they might have a mite thing going on. And so, and you can't see the mites very well, but you can see the eggs, the egg clusters and they're like at the, um, on the feathers at the bottom of the, at the, like the, on the feather shaft. Okay. Um, so look, and if you see any clumps attached to the, the feather shaft at the very, you know, where the feather meets the skin, then it's possible that they have mites and you can look online and, and look at some photos and see if that's what's going on. Um, but, uh, if she seems like she's doing okay and she's just a messy chicken, sometimes, Chickens have really fluffy butts and long feathers on their butts, and sometimes a little trim around the around that area will help with the messiness. But it sounds like you're on top of it. <laughs> oh, Samantha says, I love your book. It's very helpful. I saw it today at Tractor Supply. Thank you so much, Samantha. Okay, Holland York, frostbite, what to do? Poor Mr. Henry has been bit by frost. Um, some of the hens have it too. Yeah, it is. it has been rough, rough these last few days. I just saw in a chicken group, there was someone that they their rooster, you know, he was a kind of a smaller guy with this big comb. I mean, like he looked like Elvis. He had like this big comb. And he was only outside for a few minutes, but where we are, it was four degrees and the wind chill was much lower than that. And the wind was just really blowing. And that's when frostbite happens. That's when you're in really danger of getting frostbite is when you have those, those heavy drafts that are just so chilling. Um, and it, it was super sad because the person was really upset and I just, it can happen so fast. It really can. Um, so the main thing that you need to be concerned out concerned about is that uh, Mr. Henry cannot get frostbite again. Okay, you, you do not want him to go out into the same conditions and re-injure that tissue. All right, so you will have to be super mindful of that. If the if you know if if it gets milder where you are and that's not a danger, he can be outside. But if it becomes a danger for him to get frostbite again, you're going to have to bring him inside and make sure that he doesn't get, he doesn't get a repeated case because that will be very awful and painful for him. I had a chicken that got frostbite, um, a couple of years ago and I put A and D ointment, a very, just a, a very, uh, thin coating of A and D ointment on it really gently because that tissue is dying and it is very, it's, it can be not only just painful, but it can be, it can easily get re in, re injured. So you never want to like rub on it or anything, just as gentle as you possibly can. You're going to slather that comb with something that is soothing. Um, Neosporin, A and D ointment is what I like the best. There's also green goo that you can use um, that that I have heard good things about, but you just want to keep that area protected and keep them inside and if if they're in danger of getting it again. And you know the chicken that I had that got frostbite, it healed, and I was shocked. I was really shocked. So usually it will, you know, some some of the tissue will die and come off, but he should be fine once he gets through that you know, that stage. Okay. Um, and there is a homeopath, you know, whenever I bring, if I was to bring a chicken in immediately and it had gotten frostbite and, you know, it's kind of that, that moment of like shock, then I probably would give them the homeopathic aconite in a, in a 30 C potency. And I might just give it to them in their water and let them have a few sips of it and then take it away. Or put it in, you can put it in a bowl and you can actually put their feet in the bowl and then it will absorb up through their feet. 
Um, and there's another homeopathic, but I can't remember it right now. <laughs> but I'm sorry. I hope that he heals well. Okay. Hold on just a second. I am going to answer one more question. But before I do that, I want to let you guys know, I just want to remind you that my book is available for order. It is currently on Amazon. There it is. And there I am. Whoop, there, there it is. It's called Let's All Keep Chickens, The Down-to-Earth Guide to Natural Practices for Healthier Birds in a Happier World. It is one of the best things that I have ever done in my life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I really want to share it with you and, you know, check it out. I will leave a link in the description and in the show notes. Um, and thank you so much for those of you that already have the book, because I know a lot of you do. Okay. One last question. Holland York says, darn chicken math. Yeah. <laughs> darn chicken math. Sorry. It, the, the, you know, it moves really fast and sometimes it's hard for me to find questions. <laughs> I hope there is one more question for you to ask. Sorry. You guys are just talking amongst yourselves. And... Okay. Amber Butterfield asks the question, uh, a, a question that's on every everyone's mind right now. How cold is too cold for your chickens? So I did just do a video about this um, on my channel and it, I think that I can't remember what the name of the video is. Cause I can never remember, remember the name, but I know the thumbnail says like too cold with a question mark. <laughs> so you can look for that one. My answer to this question is it depends. It depends on the type of chickens that you have. It depends on the structure of your coop and, and you know, how, how well it's, it's constructed. It depends on you know, whether how the age of your chickens, it depends on the health status of your chickens. So, you know, if you look at my flock, I've got chickens that are old. I've got chickens that are special needs. I've got chickens that are chronically ill. I've got chicken and, you know, I've got frazzles, which is like really poorly bred frizzles. Um, I have, you know, fancy little funny chickens and, and I, you know, I just have chickens with special needs. And so because of that, I do have to supplement heat in my coop. Okay. And usually what you'll see, and I mean, I see it, I saw it so much last week and it was, it was mildly frustrating, but I understand the sentiment where people will say chickens never need supplemental heat. They will just say that as like a blanket statement. But everybody's situation is different, okay? If you've got super fancy chickens from Malaysia, you know, some very heat-hardy breed with feathers that are five feet long, and you're in a place where it's literally negative 50, like that happened, <laughs> you know? And there are places where it's like negative 40 for, you know, for several days at a time, if not weeks at a time. Okay. And you have to just use your best judgment. Like anything past negative 15, even for cold hardy chickens, that is when you need to start thinking, okay, is my coop well insulated? How, what's the construction like in my coop? What are the age, age of these chickens? Cold hardy chickens that are like adults, they're healthy, they're in their laying age, they're in their prime they are going to do fine usually in a well-constructed coop when it's negative 15 and even colder than that. Okay. They're made for that. They're, they're wearing down coats. They've got small combs and they were bred to be able to handle those temperatures. Chickens that are not cold hardy are, you know, you're going to, you're probably considering, uh, supplementing heat is not completely unreasonable. Okay. Depending on your situation, I will say that, and especially where I live, I'm in the Pacific Northwest, 
you know, people will start to get really worried when it gets below freezing. Let's say like tonight is like 31 right now. I am not worried about my chickens at 31 degrees. That is nothing to a chicken. Even my, even my, you know, my frizzle, my frazzles or whatever, they were out there. As soon as it got over like 10 degrees, I put them out there. Now I have a very well constructed coop. I'm doing the deep litter method. You know, I've got a big flock. They keep each other warm. Um, but I, you know, anything above, oh gosh, depending on the construction of a coop, anything really above like 10 is going to be like nothing for a chicken. And even into the single digits, a lot of times chickens will be fine. Now, if you have super old chickens, sick chickens, you've got to use your best judgment. So I, I, I hate that I'm not saying, you know, I'm not giving you a number. I'm not being like super specific, but the reason I'm not is because there are just so many different circumstances to consider. Okay. And, you know, in Chickenlandia, we don't have like rules. The only blanket rule that we have that I want you to follow all the time is to listen to your intuition and follow your heart and listen to your gut. And that's what I want you to do. <laughs> okay. If you start to feel like, oh gosh, you know, it's drafty in here. I really think I need to do something, you know, like I need to bring my chickens inside or you can tell that they're not doing well, then follow your intuition and you can decide, okay, it, it's too cold. It's too cold for my chickens, you know? Um, so there's that. And I, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> I went on a bit of a, a bit of a rant, um, but I hope that was helpful. Okay. Usually chickens don't need supplemental heat, but it depends on your situation. Okay. All right. Uh, I know there's probably more questions. I'm so sorry. I didn't get to everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you to my moderator and co-producer, Kelsey Paulus, also known as the Chickenlandia presidential advisor. Thank you to Talking to Crows for editing this episode and to Double M Ranch for their wonderful podcast art. If you enjoyed this podcast, please remember to rate and review it. You can give it a thumbs up here on YouTube, or you can, you know, rate it and review it on whatever app that you are using. If you're listening to it on a podcast app. But the main thing that I want you to do is to always remember that you are always welcome in Chickenlandia. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.